Well, we are on our way over to Garage Mahal. Oh, yes. It's really coming yeah, together. So it's awesome. so darn cool. We've awesome. got a little little paint to touch up, a few things, but we've been moving furniture in and setting things up. And of course, the big thing is unpacking models. And mm -hmm. in unpacking models, I came across some models that haven't been out of the boxes for probably 20 years. 20 years? Yeah, I used wow. to I used to really be into Union Pacific's turbine engines, and I modeled them in HO scale. Hmm. And I love turbine engines, so check this out. A little history and some HO models of UP's experimental turbine engines. Well, the unpacking and moving in process is definitely going forward here at Garage Mahal. And this is really, really, really cool and exciting. Most of these models have been stuck in boxes for decades. This is one of my HO scale Union Pacific turbine engines that I was working on back in the day. This is yet another one that's mostly finished. It's an 8,500 horsepower Union Pacific turbine unit. And this is Union Pacific turbine number one. It's a steam turbine. That is to say that it has an oil-fired boiler inside of it. And the oil-fired boiler runs turbines, not pistons and side rods. And the water from the boiler is recirculated through a condensing unit and sent back to the boiler. Steam locomotives had to stop about every 40 miles to pick up fresh water thousands and thousands of gallons of water. The turbine idea had actually been around for quite some time and been attempted on several railroads. In this case, we see the Chesapeake and Ohio's attempt at building a condenser unit steam turbine. But the Union Pacific's steam turbines, well, they just never worked. I don't think any of these condenser unit steam engines actually worked. But boy, do they make some nifty models. Here is Union Pacific Turbine number one and two in Ralph Gochner's collection. Now the Overland model, there was about oh, 500 of these produced, but seven of them have light up sideboards. Ralph has two of them, I have one of them. Okay, so some of these turbines were flat weird. We'll come back to this one in a minute. So the goal in all of this was to replace the massive steam locomotives of the era. Union Pacific didn't think that a diesel would ever be able to do that, but that a turbine very well might be able to do that. Now this thing is Union Pacific number 50, their first gas-powered turbine engine. It actually ran on something closer to heating oil, bunker C fuel, and it ran that fuel through a turbine engine, very similar to a jet engine, and the output shaft on the turbine was connected to a generator, which generated electricity, which ran traction motors, which drove the whole unit forward. This time, the experiment was a walloping success, and they built 10 of these units and put them into service. Those worked out so well that they built another 15 or so. At 4,500 horsepower, they could definitely hold their own in daily service, but they still couldn't replace a massive steam engine until this guy came along. This is the 8,500 horsepower three-unit turbine, and this guy could easily stand shoulder to shoulder with even the massive big boy locomotives. The three units consisted of a fuel tender, just like on a steam engine, only in this case it just held Bunker C fuel, a center B section which held the 8500 horsepower turbine engine, and a lead A unit with all of the control mechanisms and a diesel engine just for driving the engine around in the yards and shops so that they didn't have to <laughs> light up the big turbine, which was kind of a big and spectacular event and worth avoiding unless you needed to do it. Okay, and while these things could replace a big steam engine, 
they really couldn't compete with the diesel engines because you could just lash five or six of them up and get the same horsepower. So when I opened my 8500 horsepower three unit model, I found that the foam rubber has, well, uh, gone to crap over the last 20 years in storage. The model itself seems fine, and thank goodness the model is wrapped in plastic. This is why you should never place a model directly in the foam without wrapping it in plastic. In this particular case, the foam has turned into something about the consistency of, gee, I don't know, putty or something, and it's stuck all over the plastic, and it's disgusting. Now, as it happens, the foam doesn't really stick to the plastic, and it can be wiped right away, so that's good. It's not terribly important, because I don't really need the plastic, and I could just throw that away. But as it turns out, it wipes off quite easily. Inside the plastic, the model is in pretty darn good shape. There are a few uh, slightly bent foot stirrups and bent grabs and so on. Thing has been knocking around for a couple of decades in these boxes. But overall, it's fine. I want to finish up the final details on this guy, get it running really smooth, and fit it with a Tsunami sound unit and DCC controller. Now there's a great book on the subject, Turbines Westward, and if you look in the back, there's a couple of photographs of this model, the Overland 3-unit turbine engine by Utah Pacific. Now if you saw the brilliant video on scratch-built and prototype brass locomotives in HO scale with Ralph and Rosie, you've already seen a couple of these units. Ralph also has the builder's plate off of one of these engines, but he did the pattern work on these models back in the day. You know, so if you haven't seen that show, do check it out. It's quite amazing. They came unpainted, meaning that you had to do your own cool paint job. This is Union Pacific turbine number 80, and it's a coal-fired turbine. It runs on coal. They took a big boy tender, put a grinding unit in it that grinds the coal to about the consistency of talcum powder. That's piped into the center unit where the giant turbine lives, and the coal dust is fired into the turbine, generating electricity. Now here we have my model of this unit. Notice that the foam in this case has shrunk. It no longer fits the box. It's not stuck to the plastic, but it still all needs to be replaced. Fortunately, the engine here again is in pretty darn good shape, other than the fact that it's just simply not finished. It's my plan to get back to this guy, put the final details on it, put some glass in the windows, fit it with a Tsunami sound unit, and try driving it around a little bit. And here we have some cool F units that I built back in those days. Found them here in the garage, so I thought I'd show them to you. But hey, that is truly a story for another day. Okay, so a few minutes ago, I pointed out this odd looking contraption and said we would get back to it. This is an atomic turbine engine. It's loosely based on the old steam turbine, which never really worked out. But in this case, instead of an oil-fired boiler, it contains a small nuclear reactor. Just as I was being born, several railroads contracted with Dr. Lyle Borscht at the University of Utah to study the feasibility of building such a unit. Okay, so that didn't work, did it? Not because of the risks, but because of the $1.2 million per locomotive price tag. 
Well, those were some amazing engines. No kidding. They look like something out of Marvel Comics to me. I mean, it's just space age. No kidding. It's just, it's so interesting that diesel engines were kind of coming in and some people didn't believe that the diesels could ever replace the steam engines right. and some railroads were looking for some other alternative other than diesel. Wow. And there's just this this brief moment in the history of railroads when turbine engines were what some of the railroads thought was the future of railroading. Wow. And UP was certainly at the head of that list. That's really cool. Well, if you if you haven't been over to the web uh, channel, that's Toyman Television here on YouTube. There is also a website, toymantelevision.com. Both are really fun and interesting. There's what, 120 movies, oh, 100 like and it's getting right around. Not, I don't know. A lot of what? movies. So you can check those out. And of course, what you want to do is subscribe to the channel. Absolutely. Now you can get to the channel and you can subscribe by clicking on the blue button, which will appear just about now, right in here. It says subscribe. Click on it. Right. You have now subscribed. And it will also take you to the channel where you can feast <laughs> on the other 115, 120, whatever it is, movies that are over there. Well, we're not sure how you found this movie on the internet. We hope you didn't find it boring. And we will see you here again next Sunday with some more massive and informative screwing around. See ya. Bye-bye.